before I say anything about the text or anything that I have prepared or anything I am going to say, I want you to know this right now. And after I say it, you can have that as your word for the day. But I want you to hear it and I want you to know it before we say anything else. You are forgiven. Not by me. Who am I? And if I don't forgive you, I got to deal with God on that. But you are forgiven. There is nothing about you. There is nothing that you have done. There is nothing that you're doing right now. There is nothing that you're going to do tomorrow. There is nothing, anything you ever touched, said that has not been forgiven or can be forgiven by God. Oh, some of the other ministers will say, you're giving them license. No, no. I'm taking God at God's word. You are forgiven. So whatever you're holding on to, whatever image you made up in your mind because you had silly people telling you stupid things all your life, whatever you carry, whatever baggage you carry because people were so hard, just, just, just horrible to you, let it go at least from the perspective of God, because you are forgiven. Now the hard work begins. Because if you, or if, because if we are forgiven, then the next thing is, we have to forgive. And forgiveness is hard. <laughs> Forgiveness is hard. We find it hard to let go when someone has harmed us. We find it hard to forgive when someone has done us wrong. And it is an essential feature, unfortunately, of the human experience to be tempted to retaliate against one who hurt us. Oh, I know. I know what we say. I'm going to get her. You watch what I do. You know, we even include in our rules and laws of, a nation, of our nation ways to exact revenge against people who violate our rules and laws. We do it by prescribing retaliatory measures like the death penalty. We're going to get you back when you break the rules. So, Forgiveness is not natural in some sense to us. It is not easy for human family. It is not even easy, by the way, for people of faith to forgive. Now, isn't that ironic? Ostensibly, we walk into this place because God has forgiven us. And yet we, in return, find it very hard to forgive people. As a matter of fact, I have found church to be the most unforgiving place I've ever experienced. Uh-oh, he's talking about the church. No, you know what I'm talking about. Church is unforgiving. Ministers of the gospel are some of the most unforgiving people you've ever met. I dare you to watch Pat Robertson for 20 minutes if you can stomach it and realize how unforgiving you really are. And it is quite ironic that we, we, we can't forgive, especially because the biblical witness and our spiritual tradition hinge on God's relentless and persisting, persistent act of forgiving. God is always forgiving. 
Watch what God did when Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, just forgiving left and right, no matter what they did. And our whole confession of Jesus Christ and our proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ presuppose that we live in an eternal state, an eternal divine state of being forgiven. That's why I told you, you are forgiven. Yet we find it hard to forgive. And I know, I know why we find it hard to forgive. Forgiveness is hard because we, we think we think that if we forgive, then we're being called to forget. That the, we, we, we think that if we forgive, then somehow the injury and harm done will be overlooked. We, it's hard to forgive because the injury and the damage done sometimes just don't go away. We live with the scars and the wounds of what was done to us. Sometimes we, we, we think that to, to truly forgive someone is to say that the crime against us was okay. Or we believe that forgiveness means that justice won't be done. Or someone will get away with something that they shouldn't have done. Or that what happened to us is just okay in the scheme. That's why we find it hard to believe, but what I to forgive. But I hope today that we look at this story that we have and understand forgiveness a little bit better. I want us to understand forgiveness as the way God understands forgiveness, or how Jesus models forgiveness. That forgiven does not mean giving up or relinquishing our claim to justice. Rather, I want us to see forgiveness as the beginning of our claim to wholeness. Forgiveness is our beginning of our claim to living a life that is full. That's what I want us to see. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs maintains that this story of Joseph and his brothers is the first explicit act of forgiveness in the Bible. The first time that the word forgive is actually used. And this journey of forgiveness for this family began way back when Jacob's son, Joseph, the dreamer, ran afoul of his brothers because Joseph marveled in his own specialness. He had a colorful coat that was gifted to him by his father, and he lorded it over his brothers. He, he also had this gift of dreams. And then he was a spoiled little tattletale, but his dad loved him best. And he came off as self-centered and self-absorbed because of his great gifts. And so Joseph's brothers hated him. And they conspired to kill him. And while they spared his life, they did choose to sell him into slavery. And what that meant was that his brothers got rid of him. They, they got rid of all that reminded them of him. And Joseph lived a life of separation from all that he knew. A life of separation from his family. So you know, you know that he had a hard time. He had a hard life. Because that brother's act of betrayal led to all kinds of intrigue and, 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 and trouble. But through those years of trouble and intrigue and twists of fate and God's generous providence, Joseph finds himself at the pinnacle of power. He's the prime minister of Egypt. And all he has to do is say a word and put you in prison. All he has to do is say a word, and your life could be taken. And so into this, into this, Joseph's brothers come to him, bowed in humble submission, invoking the name of their dead father, and ask Joseph to forgive them of their crime against them. And Joseph, the powerful prime minister, the one who could take your life with a word. The one who can visit retaliation upon you as quickly as he could. 
says to them right away, don't be afraid. This is what I love. He asks, am I in the place of God? One of the most powerful men in the world tells the brothers who wronged him that vengeance belongs to God. And goes further, you don't have to worry about retaliation from me. Because everything you did to harm me, everything you did to me, God used. Everything you meant to destroy me, God took it to exalt me. Oh, no matter what you do, you can't get in the way of what God's going to do. Now, I do want you to know something. Joseph never said, I forgive you. Never said, I forgive you. And that's why I don't want us to romanticize this story of forgiveness. I want us to look at it hard and fast because forgiveness, as I said at the beginning, forgiveness is not easy. I do believe Joseph forgave them, even if he didn't use the words forgive. But I want you to understand something. Forgiveness is not easy. And, and it is not romantic. But I want you to know that what we saw in this encounter with Joseph and his brothers was not about forgetting. It was not about letting anybody off the hook. It was not about worrying if someone wouldn't get, wasn't going to get their just desserts. No, forgiveness happened. Happened in this instance. And I want us to take notice. How do I know that forgiveness happened and how it happened and why it happened? One, Joseph's brothers do not justify the harm they did. Joseph's brothers do not minimize the harm they did. Joseph's brothers do not pretend that they did no harm. As a matter of fact, they explicitly said, we committed a crime against you. Oh, we're on our way to forgiveness. We're on our way to forgiveness. And how did Joseph respond? Joseph does not pretend that there was no harm. Joseph does not tell his brothers to forget about it. Oh, you didn't hear me. He didn't say forget about it. Joseph relinquishes any desire to retaliate. And Joseph recognizes that no matter what was done to him, no matter what they intended for him, None of it, none of it, none of it could interfere with what God is determined to do. And so in this encounter with his brothers, Joseph had a choice to make. If he had chosen to exact revenge against his brothers for what they had done to him, his future would have been bound to a logic of conflict and anger. Let me tell you something. You either are going to stay at that moment when you were first betrayed or you're going to go forward and live a whole life. He had a choice to make. If he had retaliated, he would have been stuck right there at that very moment of betrayal. But by choosing to forgive, by accepting repentance, by easing the burden of guilt, by foregoing the opportunity to retaliate, Joseph bound himself to the logic of wholeness and reconciliation and restoration. So ultimately, forgiveness is about reclaiming our wholeness. It's about moving to a place of restoration such that we are no longer bound to the things that hurt us. And that's what Joseph and his brothers did. Forgiveness changed the whole equation. Forgiveness reassures. It calms fears. It restores people. Soothes doubt. It releases guilt. It forgoes vengeance. It moves us to a place of wholeness. Oh, it doesn't mean that we forget 
that the breach and the violation and the hurt did not happen. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we forget what happened. Forgiveness doesn't mean that those who harmed us get to act as if it didn't happen. Forgiveness means that we decide not to stay stuck in pain, anger, and brokenness. Now listen, let me tell you something. I don't want you to leave here and say, Pastor told me to forgive you. Especially if no one has recognized what they did to you, especially if someone hasn't admitted that it was a crime, especially if someone doesn't know how to ask for repentance. I'm not rushing anybody to forgiveness. Forgiveness is a long path. I'm not asking anyone to forgive the damage that's been done. I'm asking you, however, to find your way to claim the wholeness that belongs to you. <laughs> Pastor, how can you say that to us? I'll tell you how I can say it. Because if there was no forgiveness then that stone would not have been rolled away and resurrection would not have happened. If there was no forgiveness, Jesus would still be stuck on that cross exactly where the pain happened and not here where the victory is being celebrated. If there was no forgiveness, Jesus would have bound himself to the logic of humanity's darkest sin that they could commit. But no, Jesus is shouting in victory because he forgave and he's not on that cross. <laughs> Jesus himself chose a path of wholeness, of completeness. Oh, there's no way that Jesus would bind himself to the logic of hate and anger and recrimination. And so we won't either. I had a hard time when the family, family members of the Charleston Nine who were killed in South Carolina forgave the white men who murdered their family members. And even me, the preacher, said to myself, I think that was too fast. They forgave him too fast. But then the Holy Spirit began to convict me. Even before I began to preach on this one, the Holy Spirit began to convict me. And I understood something. Those family members did not want to be bound to that night. They did not want to be bound to the darkest moment in their lives. They did not want the memory of their family members to be bound to a logic of hate and So they forgave. They forgave. The history of this church. Now I'm about to get in trouble. The history of this church has been a story of an inability to forgive, an inability move to a place of wholeness. And even as the pastor of the, a beautiful, wonderful church, I still encounter not a reckoning with what happened in a powerful way, not a naming of the harm in a way that allows us to move, but only a binding oneself to hurt If we want our wholeness, if we want to be complete, if we want to be ready for what God is going to do in and through us, we have got to find a way. That's why the sermon says we've got to learn how to forgive. One of the most amazing things that happened as I was growing up and was, was in the aftermath of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was called to lead the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And this was unheralded, unprecedented. 
that a country would create a commission whereby people can come and name and tell their stories of the atrocities and the violence done to them. And the people who did the violence get to sit right there and they all say what they did. And Bishop Tutu says they, that all of these people, the people who were harmed and the people who did the harm, and came into these men and told everything that happened. And he tells the story of one young woman who came to tell about how her father was killed and, 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 and all the things that were done to them. And it almost knocked him off his chair when she finally ended her statement. She said, we don't know where this man is who killed our father. We don't know who this, where this man is that raped my mother. But we really want to find him. Because I want to know who to forgive. Oh, I can't say I have that kind of heart. But I can say this, I want to learn how to forgive like she has. So all God's children, let's bind ourselves to the logic of wholeness and restoration, of reconciliation. Let's bind ourselves to the very thing that give and bring us life. Oh, I'm not asking us to forget the damage done. I'm not asking us to not reckon with the hurt. I'm not asking us to pretend that the injury isn't acute. I'm asking us to forgive. 